Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is the Freight Bana story with my friend Shannon Breen. How's it going, Shannon? It's going good, Joe. Thanks for having me. Appreciate this. Looking forward to it. Me too. Me too. Uh, guys, stick around. Shannon's got a very interesting story and a great company, different than what I've talked to about so far on my podcast. So anyway, Shannon, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Yeah. Shannon Breen, co-founder, CEO here at Freight Bana. We're about year and a half, a little more than a year and a half into to our formation as a company. At our headquarters, Joe, is right here in Phoenix, Arizona, in Midtown, Phoenix. But we have employees that work all over the country to, to help support the brand and the team. So it's been a really exciting ride and I appreciate the call out. And we're proud about where we're at, but 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 uh, based on how we're built, we definitely don't feel like we've arrived and have a lot yet to still explore. So Yep. Well, I love I love the name Freight Vana. You know, you've seen you see like Carvana and some others others using that Vana, and it just makes you stand out. I, I know we were connected on LinkedIn for a while, and I was like, oh, what are they Freight Vana? What does that mean? So, tell us a little bit about Freight Vana. What, who do you guys serve? What, what problems do you solve? Yeah, I think we're multifaceted, right? I think the the thing from the outside people don't realize is we've got about three basic tiers for our company, Joe. We've got our brokerage logistics services. We'll unpack that a little bit, some of the uniqueness, why we created it, what we're trying to accomplish. On the other tier, we've got a technology services group led by our CTO, Don Everhart, that we go out and solve technology product problems and help be kind of a connector for different companies and and the projects they're trying to accomplish. And on the third leg, we have an M&A advisory group, FB Advisory, that my co-founder, John Gamero, runs. Um, That's really the strength in his background and so when people want to buy and sell logistics or transportation companies, they come to us and we help put those transactions together. So even in our early stages, we have a little bit of diversity and those are three channels that, that are all growing individually in their own right. So, Yep. Well, there's no doubt technology is going to continue to be important in our business. And I think we're going to see merger and acquisition. I go back and forth on this. So I've, I'm of the opinion we'll have fewer freight brokers in a decade. But let's face it, during that time on COVID, when somebody couldn't get a truck, they weren't saying, I'm just going to use the guys I use. They were like, I'll call. If a freight broker calls me, I'm taking his call because I can't get trucks this week. Yeah. So I think we see the freight brokers who continue to provide what they're supposed to provide, which is access to great carriers, they're going to have business. But I also see technologists making it easier and easier to manage more freight with fewer people. And so you could see where they get to the point where their transaction costs are much lower and how they just have a kind of an overwhelming advantage over the the freight brokers, freight, freight, smaller freight brokers. Yeah. Or, wrong way to say even smaller, maybe the less tech savvy freight brokers. That, yeah, that's a good call. And I, I'm actually really intrigued by the capital markets and how that interlaces into your statement and discussion, right? Because we've also seen large freight brokers that are tech laden, but one of their go-to-market strategies is almost to undercut from a market perspective, the cost, even maybe before they have those efficiencies and will be wildly interesting as the capital markets have obviously changed immensely in the last six months. Be interesting to see the future. If you can't subsidize those costs, and I think you're seeing some of the markers of that with employees uh, having to call back some hiring maybe pulling back a little bit on some strategies that sounded good when you had a war chest full of capital in the, in the bank. That's going to be a very interesting piece and see how those worlds converge to your point between the efficiencies and the finances. And then what is actually sustainable from a business model in this space. So I think you're going to see attrition and consolidation to your point in the years ahead in, in the logistics, non asset space for sure. Yep. Yep. So Tell me a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? And give us some career highlights before you guys started Freight Bonner. I was started when I was a boy, Joe. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. uh, I grew up in, in uh, really humble beginnings. My parents are both elementary school teachers, taught their whole lives. Had my mom for first grade. Grew up uh, on five acres in the forest in Oregon for the first 10 years of my life. 
and then my mom and dad decided to move the family out here to Phoenix where we had family. And so from, I love Phoenix, took a little bit to adjust to the, the temperature, especially in the summer outdoors as a kid coming from the great PNW. But we did that. And honestly, high school here, friendships here, college here have built my career and my, my personal network here. And I am an avid golfer too, Joe, I guess on the side on a personal note. So Phoenix checks a lot of boxes and uh, I've thought and had opportunities to, to move elsewhere in the great country. But, but honestly, Phoenix is home. My family's here. And I, I just now, especially planning these freight Vana routes here in Midtown Phoenix, I think this is going to be home, my forever home. And I'm, I'm Well, I know a lot of people that. love that area. That, there's so many companies out there now. And, and it's funny, I, I'm being a, a, a pale guy. I look and go, oh, my God. I, I don't know if I could handle that. And plus it is dry heat. I know I'm from the yeah. Midwest. I'm used to like, I'm happy. It's a, it's, it's hot and humid here. You just have hot out there. And I know it's be, be probably crazy for you to come here where you go, Oh my God, it's humid. I can't stand it. Yeah. Totally different. I mean, Phoenix is just a gem though. Right. I think in a testament to that, we got the Super Bowl coming up here in a few weeks. We've got Barrett Jackson out here going on right now. We've got the the Waste Management Phoenix Open coming up. I mean, they say like 3 million people will kind of swell Phoenix in the next two to three. There's a reason people are moving out that way. Absolutely wild this time of year with the Super Bowl and everything lining up. So, yeah, you, you can't get a, a basic hotel 30, 40 miles out of town for really anything less than like 900 bucks. It's absolutely insane right now. So, yeah. Oh, speaking of which, are you go, are you going to manifest this year? I am not, but my CTO Don Everhart and Lars Ward will be there. I will make sure to meet them too. You absolutely so, yeah, should. I will be at manifest. They are filling the calendars, and I will make sure they're on your your schedule, sir. So anyway, you grew up first in uh, Oregon. Yeah. Then Phoenix. Where'd you go to college? ASU. I'm a Sun Devil. Got it. Got a really very good nice, offer. Very nice. Got some good programs here in the state of Arizona. So made all the right business decisions to go to ASU for, for how I was able to accomplish that. So what what was your career path? Give us some uh, some career highlights before you started Freight Bana. Serial, I, in my, as I was a kid, right, 17, 18, I just wanted to do franchising. I just had entrepreneurial ambitions. I wanted 10 franchises, then 20, and then 30. And, you know, like life happens. I graduated college and had some opportunities to make make a bet at that time it was a huge financial strain on my family, right? Going back, my parents are school teachers, love the career, love that, but it doesn't create a tremendous amount of wealth for anybody that uh, is aware how that works. So wasn't able to pull that off. And so worked various jobs, real estate, worked in some restaurants, early twenties, and then actually did my own business in my mid twenties. And it, you know, 2008 came here in Phoenix, the real estate market got smashed. The business that we had was, had ancillary ties to that, that got hurt. But learned so much through that kind of process in 2008, that kind of crash, so to speak. Oh, and, uh, I learned some lessons then too. Yes. <laughs> and then my background's uh, finance. So I went back to work in the finance field for three or four years. And then a good friend that's still in the space today kind of introduced me to, at that point, transportation trucking. And I joined in the summer of 2012 and I just fell in love with the chaos and the people and the opportunities, Joe. Yeah, well, there's no doubt was a lot of opportunities. Even I, I came. I'm an automotive guy originally, and I came to from automotive when it all melted down. And like, it wasn't like one day meltdown. It was like right. 2008, 2009. <laughs> it just felt like a a rough road, and I couldn't find a job anywhere in automotive. And I'd never really been unemployed, and I was also making a lot of money. And so it was like. I felt like I was underemployed and unemployed for a few years. And uh, while I kind of got my my sea legs in a new business, which was logistics. So, yeah, a lot of us, a lot of us learned some lessons in 2000, uh, 2000, the Great Recession, I guess we call yeah, it. Yeah, and I was, it was good to go through. I tell you that the, owning my business in the 2008, I mean, from an education perspective, it's invaluable to go through those those lessons early. Yep. So you, so you got into this transportation logistics business, and then at some point, you and your partners, you saw some holes in the market, some place where you said, hey, we think there's a better way. So when and why did you start Freight Bana? And to, who was your partners? My, my co-founder is John Gamero. So he's got a financing background, JP Morgan, Ivy League school, worked for New York, San Francisco, worked for some PE firms out here. 
And I had started transportation in 12. John and I have known each, since, each other since we were kids. And he had called me in 2015 and wanted to kind of get his hands dirty, as he called it, right? He really wanted to, to be involved and in, in see how the, the sausage was made, so to speak, right? And so he ended up joining our, our night team, the night transportation team in 2015 and taking on the lead of the mergers and acquisitions unit there. Uh, there were some ambitions there to grow via non-organic, right? M&A means. Yep. And so John helped kind of set up that process there and led to a few, you know, multiple transactions, one of which being one of the largest in the transportation space, the the Knight Swift merger in 2017. So now when did when did that happen? 2017? Third, so I finalized the third quarter of 2017 was officially when it went down. For, for those of us, I'm sure I saw it, probably saw it in freight waves or somewhere, but were those were two leading trucking companies, correct? Too large. And that's what made it such a large deal is kind of a merger of common equals, but, you know, collectively became a six. Well, they they named it Knight Swift, so. Yeah, they did, they did the slash and then, you know, the leadership and, you know, the, it's a really, you know, talk about education, right? Getting an opportunity to work on that for the three to four months, right, on the transition teams and the planning, you know, before it's official, there's so much work for anybody that hasn't been through a, a merger kind of lucky and very unique in that both companies were about 30, 35 miles apart from at corporate headquarters, right? So my oh, entire wow. <laughs> first part of my career, we competed directly, right? Naturally, it's this is a competitive space. And then we worked for three or four months to kind of, okay, how's this going to work? And how are we going to put things together? And so after the merger, I was afforded great opportunities leading kind of the logistics offering, the non-asset offering for both brands under one umbrella, and figuring out how to make that work via systems and tech. And then I also had responsibility over the intermodal branch for uh, over two years, which gave me a wealth of experience that I also hadn't had uh, in the space. So that was kind of my building blocks from a career trajectory perspective, maybe in a roundabout way to answer your question. COVID happened. And on a personal level for me, you know, full transparency, you know, my father got sick with a rare cancer and, you know, still battling today and is, is still on that battle and fight. But I think for me, it was this very sobering reality, Joe. We always use these these really cliche terms, right? Life's too short. And, you know, there's so many we could throw. And those are words. And I think we throw them so loosely they don't land. For me, the, the aha was leaving my job, driving on my way home, stopping, watching my dad go through chemo. And honestly, at that point for me, and like, I honestly get like tingles just thinking about it. Like I realized in that moment, I have larger ambitions. Life is too short. My hero is struggling. And if I'm going to do something special, like I'm not going to wait, now's my time. So the, the combination of that, Joe, and then COVID hitting and kind of everybody reassessing, there were like massive, I'd say, storm forces that came together. And then it was just hopefully everything that, that you know, I'm about and want to be about that led me to be like, OK, now's the time. Let's go build something great. And if we fail, we fail. But like I, I have passion and ambition that I feel I like can carry us through. Yeah, and it's a uh, it's during COVID we we all had to reassess, and I know uh, we lost a lot of people from God. I think a lot of service industry lost people, and I hear I heard that the the great resignation or whatever the the big quit, whatever they want to call it, I think it was a lot of women ended up leaving the workforce, especially from the service industries. And I think one of the things that happened is well, first off women t tend to take the brunt of child care and elder care and th th making sure the family's run. Well, don't, don't blame me, anyone. That's just the way that's worked lately. But I do think a lot of them said, what the hell am I doing? I'm not seeing my kids enough. I'm not seeing my loved ones enough. And I think hopefully COVID recedes and some of the lessons we learned, the positive ones, we get to keep. And I think a lot more people are working remote. A lot more people at least had, as you said, kind of that wake up call. I'll tell you, for me, being here when they were talking about early on with COVID, you know, 1% of the population could die or 2%. I was like, 2%? Like that. So if I know 100 people are two going to die, like, it, and then I heard as high as 3%. I remember this sounds so ridiculous now, but I remember going grocery shopping with, you know, my mask and everything, being worried. And I'm not a hypochondriac or anything. On the and then I came home. Hunt. Yeah, and I went, yeah, I remember going home and washing all of my groceries with the idea that who knows who stocked this? 
I was like, yeah. And now, like, it was like, did I really wash and dry my groceries? I was like, I guess I did. <laughs> right. So, but hopefully, hopefully some of those positive lessons. And um, again, there are a lot of companies started. I think the rest of the world started realizing the importance of supply chain. I think the rest of the world started realizing the importance of people who are on the front lines, the ones who couldn't stay home. And um, I'll tell you what, right now, if you go to a restaurant, they are shorthanded. It seems everywhere is shorthanded. And, you know, let's face it, maybe. Well, and the warehouses, right? The warehouses that really help drive a lot of our supply chains are still struggling in a lot of areas. We haven't made those We haven't made those attractive enough jobs. And I know we're getting better. We still have made trucking a good enough job in my mind because it is a giant pain in the ass job sometimes. And I know we all give lip service to... You know, we're going to we're going to be a shipper of of choice, but I don't I know we've gotten better, but I know there can be much more improvement on all of it. So anyway, enough of my pontificating. So you started you started Freight Vana. What what did you see? What did you see as an opportunity that was not or a problem that wasn't being solved as as well as you might? Yeah, might have been. solved. I think that really I mean, obviously, the diversity, the tech problems not being solved. I think that's a a natural one, but really like to unpack the logistics side, right? So for me, got a chance to manage close to a 400 plus million dollar logistics company prior. So the problem, you know, one of the things that we had instituted in my last few years there was a power only division where we use these trailers creatively. One of the issues and a lot of the large mega carriers that you mentioned and others, they have these units, but no one had built one authentically unique. And I think there's some important factors of why it's really expensive. It's capital intensive. Most non-asset companies, Joe, right? It kind of goes against the name, right? We're non-asset, but we want to invest in assets. And so there's a confliction there, naturally. The confliction you can get over quick, the marketing you can get over quick, but maintaining and operating, creating efficiencies, much like a large carrier is really where the sauce is made. And so I saw this opportunity to have different partnerships, which we can unpack in a little bit through through our partnership with Wabash. I saw a lot of founders and businesses really going out looking for the raise and the valuation and hammering the capital markets, the PE money. What are we worth? What are we worth? What are we worth? But I really saw this opportunity to build something ground up, more sustainability, asset laden with asset expertise and build this this kind of differentiated 3PL slash asset-based network that could provide the benefits to those small truckers you mentioned, unlock some of the efficiencies that the large carriers do, and have this connector of the technology that like a 3PL in the space, like a forward-facing 3PL. So I think the, the amalgamation of those three was kind of the vision of like, okay, but if we can bring that together then we're a unique, unique piece of the puzzle. And that I think is something that shippers and carriers will invest in. And most importantly, I think it's a sustainable model that we can build and scale over time. So it kind of hit all the boxes and I hadn't really seen anybody do that with the same level of intentionality. And so I was like, I think we can be the ones and time will tell if we will or won't be, but I think we're on a really good pace. Well, you'll be one of them. <laughs> I appreciate it, Joe, but I appreciate it words, but we're very humble in our approach too. Right. So when you say, for those of us who are from a trucking background, what do you mean by power only? Yeah, fair. Power only really. We we supply the trailers, they're branded, our technology, our tracking, and we go out to the long tail of small to medium-sized truckers, which as you well know, make up about 85% of the, well. the U.S. capacity, right? That's the, for anybody listening to your podcast that's never listened, you know, doesn't know kind of the inward, you know, looking like, oh, the big companies, right? The 80-20 rule, like 80% of the cap capacities by 20% of, no, it's almost complete opposite and even worse than the complete opposite, right? Yeah. 85% of U.S. capacity is supported by trucking companies less than 100. Well, the problem is those less than 100 trucking companies don't have the presence, don't have the trailing capacity, the trailers to support some of the largest retailers, but the retailers need the trailing capacity. And so, By creating this homogeneous kind of trailer pool network, we're able to solve problems for the small carriers and access points that they don't have, give efficiencies to them, and lower some fixed cost of operations, which is a huge deal in this market. At the same time, walk into the largest shippers in the country and say, hey, here's how we're going to execute it. 
it will it will look same to you. We'll work all the tech. We'll give you great tracking. We'll do all these things. So from a power only perspective, it's our trailer and so many unique special carriers that come to Bear Force to help us operate the network that, that right. we're building. So, so power only means the tractor only, and then the trailer. You own the trailers, or uh, do you lease these trailers? Or it's a, you... a lease purchase agreement. Our logos, our tech, our everything. So it's a really special agreement we have uh, with our largest partner, Wabash. Yeah, and by the way, we increasingly want drop and hook. I think that's better for most carriers. Am I correct to say that? I think from an efficiency standpoint and from what I learned working for one of the largest, yes, drop and hook is at most times the most desirable method when you can execute it. So if I'm, uh, let's just say you're uh, a warehouse, e-commerce or retail, whatever you're, whatever you're doing, and I, I drop a trailer and maybe that's a, maybe that's a Freight Vana trailer Hopefully it <laughs> or is. Wabash, Hopefully right? Hopefully it is, yeah. yeah and so the, for the comp- company that's paying for that truck, I just bring... The, the, the carrier just brings the, their tractor, picks that up. They don't have to wait. They don't have to wait all day to be live loaded. So it's an easier in. They pick up. And then when they go to the, the retailer or that they're dropping off at, they drop there too, potentially. Yeah. Maybe it's a live unload. Maybe, yeah. But what we get away from is drivers sitting around in their trucks because we, the whole industry knows this. We want those drivers driving. They aren't driving. We want them at home. <laughs> we don't want them sitting in parking lots waiting. That is one of the, I, I, I joke about it, but it's no joke. It's in my mind, very disrespectful that we treat people that way. Because if I came to visit you at your office and you said, yeah, Joe, um, I'm kind of busy. I know we were supposed to meet at eight o'clock. I'll be with you like, 11. Right after lunch. <laughs> right after lunch. Yeah. Three or four hours. Yeah. So, like, sorry about that. Better. Yeah. <laughs> no, we and and by the way, I don't think most shippers are trying to do that either. It's just the natural. I shouldn't say it's natural. It's what happens because maybe our lack of organization and all the problems that we dump on the on the warehouses and docks. Uh, so th- it's not like they're doing it deliberately. Those guys work their asses off. So we've got to all get better. And drop and hook is better for ELD, right? It's better for ELD. Well, I, I was just say hours of service with ELD. Correct. And I, I think that, you know, studying and being in the space for as long as I have and my prior work, like people talk about adding capacity and it's, and you know, the easy one is we just need more drivers, which isn't wrong. But to your exact point, Joe, efficiency quotients can add massive gains to supply chain without actually adding to the net number of drivers. Like even when you run a multi-billion dollar organization, like the statistics would tell you the amount of utilization you're doing on that available clock for that driver is still so underserved. So if you got a 15% gain there and could do it in multiple areas, you've essentially added 15% of capacity, 15% more productivity, and you haven't added a single driver yet, right? So to your exact point, and that's where a lot of this tech and investment and a lot of the, the people putting money into this space are trying to solve that very challenging uh, chaos and discombobulation problem that you're, you're, we're all talking about. But I think, you know, it's going to like any other problem. It's going to come in steps and chips and models that, that make sense. And to your point earlier, and maybe to my statement, like we're trying to be on the forefront of that. We feel like that's what we're on the forefront of being one of those people. And hey, time will tell uh, our successes. But I tell you, early stage, our two biggest customers, our shippers and our carriers, love what we're doing, love how we bring it together, love the authenticity, love the transparency, which is a key part of our build too, that makes us very unique for how other people operate their their logistics and or trucking companies. Yeah, and I, I think for those of you who aren't aren't in the day-to-day of it, we had this, we've always had an hours of service. Drivers can only drive a certain amount of time per day. And that's for safety. <laughs> I know some people would argue that it's a, a difficult schedule to live with. For a long time, we had paper books. Now we have electronic logging device, which the advantage of those electronic logging device for tracking those hours is we're able to put all these visibility things in the trucks. Fantastic uh, thing we didn't anticipate. But I think we all realize that we would need a lot fewer drivers and a lot fewer trucks if we were really, really efficient. There are still trucks, unless tractors and trailers that are sitting around unused. So 
the role of technology and all of us logistics guys is to say, how can we do more with less? And by the way, when we say a lot less drivers, we're going to have drivers for a good long time, but we never have enough. And I think also when I say less, it would be nice if we could get to the place where we say that guy has a job that he is very predictable hours. What, if that guy wants to work for six months, he works for six months. He wants to work for a year. We figure a way where he's not working or she's not working a schedule that sucks. <laughs> Economics will dictate too, Joe, right? I think when you study also the game, you've seen the length of haul decrease exponentially year over year with the rise of e distribution centers, uh, just in time, the way we purchase, you know, online purchase orders, like I mentioned with e So as that length of haul decreases, the efficiency quotients become even more challenged because there's less like long-term miles on the road for truckers. The benefit to truckers is now you have a lot more jobs where you're not a- gone as long. So potentially that, which then heightens the propensity or the need for more efficient schedules to your point, trailer pools, being able to get in and out because people can do more moves in a shorter, shorter length of haul and still sleep in their beds at night. And so I think all of those are coming together. And so there's, there's, People like us and others that are out there trying to be, like I said, uh, challenging those paradigms and being able to unlock some of those value streams that are. Well, I think we we need that we need the techies though because they're the ones who can help us be more efficient. And I, I think about this as I, it was a revelation to me one time. Somebody said, "Oh well, this guy goes from Detroit to Chicago every day, and then the next day he comes." He picks something up and he drives it back. Oh, maybe it was in Chicago because that's only four and a half hours away. But basically, he would drive halfway to a location, trade trucks with a guy. And he so he was in his bed every night. Every morning, he would drive a, a truck halfway to a location. And these two guys, you know, high five, switch trucks and drive back. And I thought, as opposed to the older way, was this the one guy would drive all the way there and... And he's not sleeping in his bed. The other guy who's driving the opposite direction is not sleeping in his own bed. And when I first heard that, I was like, oh, my God, this is great. This was years ago. And we need to do more of that. But the way we do that is with technology. And one other thing I want to make a point here, guys. You mentioned that long tail. So the largest trucking companies in America have 1% or 2% of the market. Mostly are less than 1%, like top guys. Easy, yeah. So that's very different. You can't say that about automotive, you know, the big OEMs. It's like 10 OEMs have like virtually all the business, right? And then when you look at uh, grocery stores, same thing. We have these big players. They're still little mom and pa's, but we all know the, the big ones. The big CPGs dominate, right? And we could all rattle those off. And you don't realize how many brands are underneath that. Right. And what's weird is then you switch over to less than truckload, the top 10, the top 10 LTL companies, the Old Dominions, FedEx, et cetera, they have 80% of the volume. And then you go over to a small parcel. We have FedEx and UPS and USPS, United States Postal Service. They, I don't know what they have right now. I'm guessing it's probably 80% of that market. Things are changing in all these. I think we're, they're going to see a little more, but Right now, the the reality and for the foreseeable future is there will be lots of small trucking companies, and we have to find a way to to uh, make that. We got to help those businesses survive and thrive. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. Yeah, and these market conditions unfortunately challenge challenge companies in general. You've seen the big company challenges and how they, how they solve that problem. Unfortunately, for a small trucker. And you layer in all of the fixed costs that they have to deal with. Yes, regulations. But you add insurance costs. Fuel has come down from its top, but still is very high. Equipment costs and availability is still a struggle. We go back to capital markets not in their favor. Cash flow is not you know, necessarily the strength of a small trucker that's trying to build a, a business and has all those responsibilities. Um, repairs, maintenance, we could just add it up. You take this fall that we're experiencing right now and have since I don't know, March, April of last year, no peak season. Then a, what is abnormally a very slow first quarter, you're putting a, we, in general, the market puts a massive strain on those small carriers, which is, which is something that people often don't see. What create, well, what creates it coming back up? It's not just feels and moods and purchasing power. 
what happens is these small truckers are literally going out of business, culling their fleets, selling their equipment, getting out of the space because it's not financially feasible for them to sustain the storm that is. And so that is the cold, hard, unfortunate truth of the freight markets behind the scenes. We try to be a partner that can can help our folks through it through our through our you know platforms and the stuff we do with those guys but that is the cold hard truth about the the freight cycles and what's really happening behind the scenes that drives the the, the market swings i saw on freight waves yesterday like a third generation trucking company they had warehouses they had um, a brokerage other stuff and they sold off their 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 selling off their trucks and they one of the things that I, struck me is they said the rates went way down but our cost didn't and i was like oh ouch <laughs> And you got to be able to sustain that, right? Like people are like, oh, well, it'll change, but be a business owner, have all of that fixed cost. You have certain cash. There's not great access to capital. Like you, hopefully people can appreciate the squeeze that is at that size. And yeah, the market will change, which is why some of the big guys are well prepared to kind of weather those storms, but the small guys aren't. And so you asked me earlier about what one of the, the, the things that we're solving is we show up in a very transparent way. We're not opportunistic when we, we, you know, a broker in general in any market, right, makes margins. We try to show up on both sides of that equation in a very unique way with some of our technology so that we are treating both sides very fairly and we don't take advantage of it because we do appreciate appreciate a shipper that needs to save costs. We try to appreciate and do lean into, you know, the sustainable opportunities for these small truckers that are looking for them. And hey, let's be honest, Joe, we need to be sustainable as a business, right? So You've got to show up in a different, a unique way to kind of bring those parties together instead of always feeling like one person in that party, depending on the market pendulum, is taking advantage of one another. And so that's really our passion is to be a consistent, fair partner that can execute and not be taking, uh, let's say, advantage of the arbitrage that the market sometimes giveth to the disadvantage of our partners, which quite honestly, if we talk about how this industry has developed, is a lot how it feels at most times. And we wanted to be very unique and intentional about building something different. Yep. So I know we talked about you have really three three businesses. One is this kind of this um, tech. We'll get to tech. But this, so you have a brokerage, which I understand how brokers make money. Now, but, but you also have trailers. So how do you make, or, I'm sorry. Yeah, you have trailers. How do you make money in that business? That's a tough business to make money. You've got to be, I mean, I, I've got a world-class team with a lot of asset-based experience. My technologists, we spend a lot of time building tooling to help us with the efficiencies and the productivity on those trailers, because when you're carrying that level- But is it just But is it just leasing to like a, a, a carrier? No, or a we shipper? own them. We operate them. So we, there, there are logos, there are responsibility. When the trailer, when the, when the power-only carrier comes in, they take short-term responsibility because obviously they're- driving our asset down the road. So we have a, a handoff and interchange agreements that help with that. But how do we make money? Like we make money because A, our partners want us to be successful. We bring value right, right. to them in unique ways. And they want to see us continue to grow because we're a differentiated solution to what they've seen before. Right. So most, I would say most brokers, 3PLs, they would not have any assets. Oh, wrong, wrong way to say it. The non-asset Great brokers would have not have any assets. You guys have some assets. You have the tra- you have the track the trailer, so you're a little different than that. And and again, I think some some companies are going to really appreciate that because we are doing more drop and hook. How much drop more do you? I don't know the percentage. How much more drop and hook are we doing since uh, the ELD mandate of five years ago? I don't have that stat. I really. Don't. I'm, I'm guessing it's ten to fifteen percent more. I'm going to make that up. Maybe somebody could correct me on that, but I I know it's got to be more. It's probably a little bit more, but understand that like those small truckers we talk about because of those cost constraints, the capital investment constraints and everything we've discussed here, Joe, they can't just go absorb having an abundance of trailers for the storage, for the maintenance, for the fixed cost. So, so a lot of these smaller trucking companies are kind of in a way stuck without the ability to go scale the trailer pools. And that's where someone like us can be an unlock. So you guys, in effect, like, so if I'm a small trucking company, I say I have a truck and a trailer and I have another truck and a trailer. You could get to the place where you say, you know what, we're not going to even bother. We're we're having trailers because that costs money. They're not cheap. (laughs) They're cheaper than a tractor. 
but I'm not going to worry about the maintenance of that. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go to a lot of this drop and hook business, which I like better anyway. So I work with a company like Freight Vana. That- yeah, exactly. We've got a couple of our key carriers today, you know, full transparency, right? They've gone out and they've taken their trailers and now they've leased them to another partner or company so they can use them. And a couple of their company drivers are just running in our network almost fully, right? So they've been able to reduce their costs monetize their asset or sell it. But a lot of our guys have just either, you know, maybe just done a short term lease with somebody else and now they're running our stuff. So talk about showing up to help continue to create opportunity, maybe even a different type of revenue stream for the the, the person. That's how we're a different partner. And, and hopefully, you know, over time, I, I think that's what's going to set us apart in the marketplace. So let's talk a little bit about the tech. You you sell technologies to shippers and carriers. What How does that work? What, what kind of tech are you selling? And manufacturers, I think, look, the way I would explain it, there was a, a, a large carrier in here yesterday. Like the way I explain it to everybody, I'm from the PNW, but, you know, I'd explain it like Lockheed Martin back in the day with the Blackbird, right? If you've read the book, uh, if you know the term skunk works, right? When they wanted to build this amazing game changing aircraft, right? They basically realized, hey, we we have the talent to do it. But our people, like most companies, are so encumbered by the maintenance and the day-to-day and the current business projects. So, like, the great thing that they did or the, the test that they did was, like, okay, they took a group of, like, these special engineers and different people. They literally put them, I think, in a tent next to the main facility, if you read the story. And they're, like, you are now not encumbered by the, the beast, the business, the whirlwind, whatever term you want to use, right? And this group went out because they were be able to be creative and had that they, they created essentially what was the Blackbird, right? So it was this amazing business experiment that rolling it back to what we want to be and what we hopefully did in our prior jobs at an $8 billion company is creating these tools and creating these opportunities via technology to create immense value. And the reason why is because you could just really work on the creative products and deliver those and not worry about kind of that balance between maintenance and innovation. And so for the companies that hire us, they're like, man, I've got a good team, but I want to do this and this and this. And it's like, we can do that. Now let's set up a project plan. Let's work on the details. Let's lay it out. Let's talk about cost. Let's talk about resources. But now you've got companies that are are multi-billion dollars that are reaching out to us because they've got these projects and we can be the people that run at them and honestly keep them on the tracks and do all that. And so that is the really special part about what we're building from our FB Technologies group. And Don's one of the best in the industry. He's well-respected. And he's been doing this twice as long as me in the, we're same age, but he's been doing it twice as long in the transportation space. And you'll like this, Joe. He comes from like an operational, like customer service background. Like he is not a prototypical tech guy. He's grown in tech as a hobbyist. And so his team kind of has that type of a culture to it, which is a great opportunity to show up and solve some problems for people that that undoubtedly have them. Even if you have a ton of money, you probably have technology problems or you have bandwidth problems or organizational problems. That's where we're a great fit for people. Yeah. By the way, I get emails and I'm sure you do, do, do too. Every day I get an email from somebody saying, let us build an app for you. Let us build this. Let us build that. And and good for them. I'm not. I'm not against it. I get those but same emails. So. You, you, you kind of wonder, like, God, if I had to go pick a tech company to do something for me, who do I pick? Right now, I, I would argue that you want to get somebody who's actually working in this industry. There you go. Now that I, I can name some of those, and we'll, no need today, but I can name companies that say they've worked on transportation management systems they've worked on wms they've worked in all these systems and they have a background and that makes sense to me rather than say oh i'm going to go work with these guys and um by the way they're in a different time zone yeah. different country and and i'm going to i'm going to try and explain trucking to them i'm going to try and explain my business to them and i th- think why not go to someone who kind of gets it? Well, and that's where experience <laughs> matters, right? And so not that we lead with our resumes, but when they're like, oh, that's your team. Oh, wait, that's your hundreds of years experience. Wait, where were you, right? Like think about, oh, you were at a place that moves 60,000 truckloads a week. You were at a place that's been through multiple acquisitions. You developed these tools. Now, in the last two years at Great Bona, here's what you're building. Here's what you're doing. So your point on that nascent experience, now imagine someone be like, hey, I've got like a transportation and tech problem. 
and I want to bring some people in that can like just be creative and help me. Like we stand out pretty well in that space and we feel like we present very well and we feel like we've got the chops to deliver the goods most importantly. So for us, it's a natural fit and that group is expanding, which hey, in, in, in another creative way helps us honestly add more people to our team that then very fulfilling cycle, as you can see, Joe, then what? They're helping us build the technologies that we also are utilizing and, and need. So it this is this very cool loop, this efficiency, this investment that continues to offer very solid returns as we just grow our brand, our presence, and leave a mark on the industry. And so when we and with, and like when we do those deals, like people are like, man, I love it. And then obviously, just like happened in my last life, Joe, what happens? You do one or two projects, guess what? How many other people, wait, hey, wait, hold on. Could they do, could they do, right? And you start small and you start humble. And if you execute, then you get a lot of people with creative ideas and you're a partner that they, it's not just for five months. They're like, man, like I want to do this. Now they put you on a roadmap where you're working on multiple projects, which is really fun and exciting. We all enjoy it. It's it's awesome. Yeah, it keeps you guys on the cutting edge. So that that's excellent. So last thing I want to talk about as far as your business goes is the advisory yeah. and M&A. So talk about... Not so much what, what you guys do, but the, the the why is there a need? What's going on in the market that we need it? For first off, for M and A means merger and acquisition yeah. guys, for anyone who's not in that biz. But why do we need that in the space? Well, uh, go back to your tech statement. I think let's start there. Every bank, every something, everybody can quote, "Hey, we can sell your business for you." Right? You get the same emails. Do they understand transportation? Do they understand, like, let's just start there. Do they understand transportation and logistics? Like you take all those emails of people that can sell your business, which I also get, I don't know, 20 of those a month. How many of them understand transportation and logistics, right? So huge advantage for working where we did. John has the background of the M&A experience. His team is very well experienced. So I start there. Hey, do you have understanding of transportation and logistics? And then at what level of granularity, like, have you done purchases in this? I think from a need perspective, and you see this as folks are 20, 30 years into building these trucking companies, 80 trucks, 100 trucks, 200 trucks, they get to sell their company how many times, Joe? <laughs> Once. <laughs> one time. You get to sell it one time. So having a trusted advisor that's worked, once again, and seen it at the biggest, has done the purchasing, has known how to prepare your business for sale, knows what the organizational structure needs to look like, can ask the pertinent transportation accounting questions to make sure you're showing up in the best light. Let's be honest, a majority, because I don't want to say all, but a majority of trucking owners that have built amazing businesses, that's not their bailiwick. Yeah. And so now imagine being able to bring that to bear for them. So on the sales side, as a sales side advisor, we do both. That is, that is a very nice connection point where we show up and help them prepare their company for the one special moment they get selling their, their baby. And, and we, we take a lot of pride in, in doing that. Yeah. And am I right to say that this is usually not an overnight process oh, either? So, yeah. <laughs> so if you're talking to somebody, let's just say I, I'm, I'm a trucking company and I'm talking to you, you would say, well, I'm just making this up and you can elaborate. You might look at me and say, Joe, this is great. What do you guys specialize in? I go, oh, I do this, I do that. And they might say, Ugh, you know, what you really need is to own a few lanes that are really the top-notch lanes, right? You might also say, you have an old terminal that you're no longer using. I say, uh, yeah, I do. Get that off the books. Right? S- sell it now. It's just dead wood. You're making a payment on it. And you might also say, update this website. You know, what's so you can help me. And I, what I think people underestimate is the time it takes to clean this up. And then once you're completely clean, to actually start finding buyers. Yeah, <laughs> Am yeah. I right to say oh, that? Right. You're absolutely right. A couple of highlights I'd give for anybody out there. One, long term process, right? We have worked with people for over a year before they even are ready to sell because of all those reasons you said. The other one that doesn't get processed as much that is just as critical. Think about it. Someone's coming to buy Joe Lynch trucking. Well, the reality is, Joe, you you've been the guy for two decades. What's your org structure look like? Who's going to carry the weight? Joe, are you going to be what's your intention, Joe? Are you are you done done or are you looking to do an earn out over the next two years? No, Shannon, I want to I want to work for five years. Okay, well, there's a big difference. Joe, hey, I want to work for five weeks. 
oh, okay. So, right. So there's the technical side, which you're talking about, but there's also this like structural side because I'm going to come buy Joe Lynch trucking and Joe, this is going to sound like right on par for you. Like you're the linchpin, right? You're, you're the linchpin in this deal. So, so now I got to be like, well, who's your second in charge? Are you bringing someone in? Who's going to do this? How, right. you know, cause the company that purchases, right. They need an ROI. And they can't have this thing fall like a stack of cards when they come in. And they're going to ask tons of questions. And that is going to be a critical one that honestly, you've just always ran your trucking company and made money and took care of your people and your family and all that. You haven't think thought through really a full blown succession plan. Oh, yeah. Someone comes in and spends tens of hundreds of millions to buy you. They're going to care about that plan. And so we work with those companies to develop that plan. And we feel like we show up in the right way to get that done. Right. And, you know, also, you think about this, most companies, you know, your company probably, all, all, especially smaller companies, the CEO is probably the number one sales guy. He's the alpha. No, normally, yeah, yeah he's, he's the, the alpha well, in a couple we've worked Well, with. they're the ones who care the most, obviously, at least initially. So they're the ones who are st- selling the most. They're the ones who care the most about the company. They're the ones who are most interested in the finances, right? And oftentimes, the operational expert. And so they're they're that as you said the linchpin. Also, you like that too. I know only, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. There's another piece to it, which is um, sometimes you you have a company and you go, well, I've got my brother-in-law on board, and I got my my uh, wife is still getting a salary and all that. And then so never seen says, that, Joe. Yeah, this, never seen this that. yeah this <laughs> this company is making a million dollars, well, or two million or ten million a year, but if you got some of these people off the payroll who don't necessarily need to be on the payroll, maybe it makes 12 million and you're getting paid a multiple. So if you say, I, got, I just cut some dead wood, I got rid of a terminal, I got rid of some underperforming assets, I got rid of maybe people who weren't hitting on 100%, right? Now maybe my company's worth a lot more. But again, these things don't happen overnight. And by the way, they probably don't happen at all unless there is a reason. And <laughs> often the the, another challenge with this, I'm a, and you could probably expand on this, is companies get sold because of death, death of a partner, maybe partner problems, maybe a divorce. You don't have your, you don't have the time to go clean house. You don't even understand how dad ran his business. Yeah. You got to find, you got to clean it up and get it out. You, you are hitting it right on the head. And then I just give the other side of the coin. Right. Those are sellers. What about purchasing and why you mentioned consolidation earlier? Trucking will continue to go through a consolidation. And why? Go study all the largest truckers, medium sized truckers and ask the question, how many are growing organically? And the answer, not many. Right. And so I would tell you in my prior life, the reason why John was excellent and the team was strategically on the front edge. They realized that's John Knight. Yeah, they realized years ago, hey, we're going to grow via strategic acquisition. So now we get these mid to large size companies. And hey, like it doesn't take much for someone to realize where my last company sits in regards to profitability, decision making, value purchasing, a lot of benefits that go with being that size. But that analysis, now if you're wanting to purchase and you're like, well, how would how would some of the biggest, best, most profitable companies assess a purchase? Help me. Help me, help me because I'm here. I want to double my fleet and it ain't going to come organically. Cool. Let's start talking about regional. Let's start talking about purchasing. Let's start all those lists of items that, that John and his team will work through. We can show up for people looking to, to acquire and grow their company, which is going to be a continued trend for all size truckers, which is why the one you know had visited us recently here in our headquarters. Like we want to be that person. They're like, Help us with your flow. Tell us, identify a couple good fits. Here's what we're looking for. Here's our wish list. And once again, that's someone that knows the space and we know that analysis. And John is one of the best in the industry at it. So that's where you can see our passion, hopefully, in it. But honestly, why we've continued to grow that arm of our business at an exponential rate. Yep. So during COVID and even before, we had this really... It was a seller's market. Everybody wanted to sell their trucking company or their freight brokerage, their 3PL warehouses. There was, and the big guys were buying, mid sized companies were buying. We had all this private equity money in. 
we've changed since COVID. Rates are down. Some trucking companies are struggling. Some brokerages are going to struggle during this time. Is it still is it still a hot market to sell? It's a tougher market to sell. And I would tell you, even in the high water market, as a trusted advisor, because look, if someone's walking in with tens of millions of hundreds of millions and they're worth their salt, you know what they're doing? They're also not, they're, first, they're fully aware of the freight markets. And so there's this reality, much like, like take it to a personal level, like a, like a realtor that walks in, you're like, you're proud, right? My house is worth X. And they're like, Joe, I hate to tell you, I get the passion. I get this is personal for you, but based on boom, 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 and boom, your house is really worth this. And this is where I think it's selling. There's an emotional experience that happens there. Oh, yeah. And and when we're going, we're going through the high times of the market, the same thing, like, no, no, this is this and mine worth You this. don't understand. You don't understand the value of my company. Yes. And and we walk in and say- Because hey, it's my baby. These purchasers <laughs> are going to look at a three-year rolling average. What? Well, think about it. You think they're going to buy at the top just for the top sake and they don't know how freight markets and pricing and this, like they're going to want to normalize that investment. And we just, and Hey, part of being a good advisor and or real estate agent is what just leveling on the front end. And Hey, there will be plenty of people that'll walk in and be like, Oh yeah, Joe, you wanted what? Oh, I can get you that. And the reality was that was never true, but what they want to do is get you to sign on the dotted line. And then what they figure out later is like, Oh man, like some things happen, right? That's not very authentic. So I think from our entire brand, and you'll see it in our tagline with technology, transparency, and trust, like that's how we show up at every level of our org, Joe. And so that's important because when we come in, we'll tell you, hey, sorry, Joe, your house isn't worth this, but this is why. Here's the analytics. Here's our experience. We're going to be here's what we recommend. And hey, (laughs) if you want to go with somebody else that tells you the moon, I'm going to, hey, I tell you what, keep my number. Keep my number. Don't sign a long-term agreement and call us in four months when that doesn't work out. Right. By the way, my my um, ex-wife's a real estate broker, and I remember hearing her talk about this many times. Where a lot of realtors will say, "You always want to be the second or third realtor." So, and I, I watched her experience this, and it's it's a horrible process to live through for realtors and brokers. Is they they have they come in, you see your house, and they go. Oh, Joe, this is beautiful. We think this is worth, uh, geez, $400,000. You go, 400000 Are you crazy? Uh, let me show you the custom blank blank, right? And it's worth every bit of 500000 And then they're like, well, here's the market comps. Those houses are, those aren't my comps, right? And of course you feel that way. You raised your kids there maybe, or you, you, you personally did the custom blank, blank, and blank. And after six months being not not selling their house for the inflated price they had in their head, they fire the realtor because they say the realtor sucks. The next realtor, the realtor comes in and says, yeah. yeah, the house is worth about 400000 And they go, no, no, you're just as dumb as my old realtor. <laughs> and then it, when by the time you're the third realtor, you're like, all right, my house is worth $400,000. <laughs> $395,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, but that's, and, and again, that's, if we say houses, it's emotional. All of them. We all buy it based on our emotions. When you're selling your business, it's a once in a lifetime. By the way, the vast majority of businesses in this country, in all countries, I imagine, never get sold. They aren't that big. So if you're lucky enough and good enough that you were able to build this great company, you also have put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in it. And nobody wants to sell low. Nobody wants to, their bubble popped, right? They go, I had this much in my my mind, and that's probably why. Probably realistically, you should be talking to someone like you, or you know, somebody like you. We're biased, but yeah, years, years, years in advance, because you need to get that level set and have them tell you you might want to work on this, this, and this. And by the way, you also want to have a specialization because when somebody does buy you, they say, you know, why we're buying them? They do. Tons of work in the Northeast, and we got nothing in the Northeast. We wanted to expand in the Northeast. So, hallelujah, we'll take you. Yeah, find a trusted advisor. We want to be one of those people. We had different roles, but now here under this banner, we are able to do all of what you just said. And then that's, and hey, then you're just in, the, you know, talk about, I don't want to keep talking about your ex wife, but, you know, how big are referrals, right? So now we sell John, you know, Joe's trucking yes. company. Guess what? Joe has this amazing experience. Joe, how many other truckers do you know because you've been in the business two decades? 
and you tell right. them the story about what happened. And they're like, you know what? If you really want to get this done right, you call those guys at Freight Mana, FB Advisory, they'll get it done. Like there's power just like it is in real estate. So you don't see a ton of marketing force there because most of our stuff comes via word of mouth from the from the great owners that we've already served. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. So Shannon, I want to wrap this bad boy up. Yeah. I've gone way over my time with you, of course. <laughs> but let me ask this. Who's your sweet spot when it comes to your businesses? Just give me the kind of the high level for the three three services you guys provide. Yeah, on the technology side, I think if you're a mid, mid-market mid carrier or a large carrier that, that needs some technology and wants it to advance, we're a great partner there. On the advisory side, I think we just talked about it, right? You're looking to, to grow via acquisition or you're ready to start selling or want just an honest free assessment of what we would assess your business and the things that we think you need to work on in the meantime. Great, great for that channel. And on the logistics side, for carriers looking for a trusted broker, one that's not incentivized to play the games, the gamesmanship that most brokers are, are kind of built upon. Like we're, we're a great partner for shippers in that manner. We're invested heavily too with our trailers. And then clearly shippers that are looking for a differentiated solution because this back and forth, we think the future supply chain problems will be solved truly via collaboration and partnership, which is easy to say. But via our systems, our investments, and our execution, we think that sets us apart. So if you're a shipper looking for a new partner, and hey, truth be told, right now, shippers are like, I'm good. I got all the partners I need. But just like that owner you talked about, Joe, it's not about the now that you're working towards, right? What about the next upswing market inflection? Who will your partners be then? How did they treat you on the last cycle? And if you invest in us now, we want to be there for you when that changes to show you what different looks like. So if you're that shipper that's saying, I don't need a partner because I my stuff's good, I'd say, I understand why it's so great, but give us a shot, get us in there because when the market changes, you're going to want someone like us that's not incentivized to take advantage of. Exactly, exactly. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. I'll also put a link to any links you give me to your website and um, white papers or whatever. And we will see who's your partners will be at Manifest this week. Yo, Don Everhart, love you to meet him at Manifest. For anybody else going, reach out to us. Lars Ward, our VP of Business Development will be there. They are making the drive from Phoenix. They're excited about it. I couldn't make it this year, but they will represent. How far is that Phoenix to Vegas? Five hours max with the new 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 freeways and systems. So it is a it's much easier to drive than even fly, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Five hours is about the limit, it right? Is. Where you say, do I fly? Because sometimes you get to an airport and, you know, I, I know this is going to come as a shock to some of you. Sometimes there's disruptions in sometimes there, there. the airlines. I've heard about that being a possibility sometimes. <laughs> yep. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time, Shannon. Joe, I loved it, man. Thanks for all you do and thanks for the support, okay? Yep. Thank you. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.